Welcome, 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 Housers, to another episode of On the Way Home. I'm your host, Michael Braithwaite, and it is my great joy to work with over 120 people at Blue Door, the organization I'm from that operates in York Region, Durham Region, and Peel Region, and has for the past 42 years, uh, where we work with our most vulnerable to provide deeply affordable housing, supportive housing of all types for all sorts of different specialized populations, including 2SLGBTQ+, uh, youth, senior men, families, women escaping violence, and so on and so on. Uh, we also provide, we bring health care to the vulnerable individuals uh, so they can remain housed and find housing. And we break the cycle of poverty through our construction social enterprise construct, which launches and trains people to go into the trades where they can make a living wage right out of the gate that continues to grow and much much more check us out at bluedoor.ca let's talk about today's guest uh we talk about the importance of involving developers in the development of affordable housing um and you know we talk about it but where's the action well um, we're bringing the action to you today today we have uh sherry uh, Larjani and Sherry is the CEO and president of Spotlight Developments. And, and Sherry, for the past since 2010, has built uh, thousands and thousands of units of housing and goes about it just a little differently. And we talk about that today. We talk about her journey into this work. It's a very male dominated field development. Uh, she started off doing a lot of work in, in schooling and work in architecture, design. Now, that wasn't really uh, for her. And then just kind of jumped in with both feet with some support from her father-in-law to do her first project. It just grew and grew and grew. And you can tell by her energy in this podcast, I mean, she is going to smash down any barrier that's put in front of her, no matter how challenging it is. We talk about how Spotlight Development came around. We talk about a special project in 2019 that was an all-female-led uh, development project that is just now kind of... Uh, well, looking for occupancy, I think they're going to be able to uh, have occupancy with that development in the next year or so. We talk about a major project called Inclusive, where Sherry's worked with uh, all sorts of different partners, where she looks at, she kind of flips the script, because sometimes you look at, hey, maybe it's 30% affordable, 70% market rent, where she's got 70% affordable. 30% market rent. She makes the financials work, bringing all sorts of different partners on and meeting their needs uh, and really, you know, leading the way and showing other developers and government how this can be done. Um, she's pushing for more support from government, wants government to get more involved. But listen, on this podcast, we talk about leadership. We talk about innovation uh, and we talk about, of course, affordable housing and all of those are um, what we discuss in this podcast with a brilliant and talented uh, Sherry uh, Larjani from Spotlight Development. It's a great pod. Take a listen. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us on the podcast today. Of course, anytime. We ask the same question to everyone because it's very personal and different for each guest that we have, and that is... What does home mean to you? Um, so to me, home is a place where you can feel yourself, where you can feel safe, where you can feel secure. And I think it's also a place where it allows you to prosper and grow. Uh, it's where sort of you build up your, like in a, in a home, to me, the family comes to mind first and that family is where um, you start to find the confidence in yourself to do more and to grow. So I think to me, um, home is where you can um, not only feel secure and safe, but also a place for you to start and grow from there and to become whatever it is that you want to become. So that's what I think. <laughs> that's what comes to mind when I think of home. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and like I said, there's no right or wrong. It's, it's no. really what, and I think of the themes you said there, uh, to grow and have confidence to do that leads me right into my next question is you've had a wonderful life and career journey, a different path. I'm hoping you could walk us through some of that to uh, where you are now at Spotlight. Sure. So um, it's a it's a pretty long story. I'm going to cut it into a very short version of it because we don't want to take up the whole time talking about uh, my story. But um, again, the reason I think I always think about the confidence and uh, 
it being built up in you from a, a family home. Um, I was lucky enough that I was raised by a father who um, gave me the confidence I needed. Um, and that confidence allowed me to grow and to become what I am today. And then along the line, I was also helped by other men that were supporting me, such as my husband and my father-in-law, who helped me and allowed me to grow by supporting me and, you know, building up my confidence. And um, that is why, you know, I entered such a male-dominated industry, you know, that would be a development industry. And uh, I started by, you know, studying architecture, doing a little bit of design work, and then kind of figuring out that's not for me. And then sort of getting into the business side of, of the development industry and starting to venture into building single family homes and starting to slowly grow it, educate myself. Again, I don't come from a family that um, has any background in, in development. So I had to build up everything for myself. I had to uh, grow, learn, and, and um, understand how this whole industry works. And I did it mostly by partnerships. You know, I, I partnered with people. I learned from the people who came with experience. And, you know, there were instances where I was very lucky with my partnership. And there were those that did not work as well as I, was, I hoped or worked um, to my detriment at points. And I learned from those as well. And I've learned that it's important who you pick as a partner, how you do the work that you do, um, and how, you know, how you treat others. Um, in this industry. And um, that sort of uh, helped me um, grow in this industry and uh, be able to do all the projects that I'm doing and all the work that I'm doing. So um, it's um, it's been a, a challenging ride, but it's also one that I have enjoyed very much. And it hasn't always been easy or pleasant. It's always had its ups and downs. Very cool. And now you're, for, since 2010, I believe, Spotlight Developments. Tell me a little bit about how did that come about and what is it all about? So originally, um, my venture into the world of business um, started by building a single family home, as I just mentioned. So I was lucky enough that I, uh, that my father-in-law said, hey, you weren't made to be doing uh, architectural work in an architectural firm. I invest in you. I believe in you. Um, go and start building a, sing you know, a home, design it and build it. I took that very seriously. So I bought my first piece of land and I went and I became, I tell everyone this because it's important to that. I became the designer, the site supervisor, the site cleaner, the manager, uh, the HR, absolutely everything on that little job site. But it also made me, um, uh, you know, as a supervisor, as someone who's standing there watching this house get built, it also taught me so many things. It also taught me so many things about uh, people, contracts, um, dealing with different people, trades, uh, building a house. And that's how I started. And it started to grow by me doing more of those homes and building more and growing into townhouses and then growing it into, you know, small um, two or three story projects and then growing it into my first condo site. And that's when I started to realize that in order for me to grow further from there, I needed the partners. And that's when I started to bring in the partners. And that's when I started to do more projects. Uh, and that partnership allowed me to be able to, um, you know, work on larger sites and, and bigger store, like bigger, bigger footprints and, and higher, uh, you know, floors. And that sort of um, gave me the chance to, um, you know, become someone in the in the development industry and then do everything else that I've done since. And you've mentioned uh, previously, it's a very male dominated, making it a little tougher. You broke through. I want to talk about in 2019, a very unique female led project. What can you tell me about it? How did that come about? What was the focus? How did you make it happen? What did you do? Yes. So this goes back to when I was talking about partnerships and good partnerships and bad partnerships. So as I was searching for a partner uh, for my first condo site that I had purchased, um, I, and again, not being afraid and having the confidence to be able to pick up the phone and cold call people, especially developers, as you know, in this industry, um, uh, it's not easy to find partners. What I did is I used my old methods of, you know, cold calling. And I picked up the phone and I called um, David Wex from Urban Capital. And I said, hey, I have a site that's very close to your River City project. Would you partner with me? 
And I think, you know, he, he was shocked because I don't think normally people would get calls like that. But it also enticed him to understand and figure out who I am and why is it that I'm making this phone call. That initial meeting led to me being introduced to Taya Cook from Urban Capital. And uh, when she came up with the idea of wanting to build the first all-female development project, as she says, she couldn't think of anyone but me because I was also a female developer in this industry, struggling at times to you know, find my way and to um, sort of um, be able to poke my head out between all this men running all these uh, development uh, um, uh, you know, firms. So she called me up and that's, that's how this project got started. Um, she called me up and she said, are you interested? And I said, heck yes, I am. Like, this is the best opportunity. And, you know, we knew so many of the women that we hired and we worked with on the Reina project because we, they had been previously working on so many of our projects. So it wasn't a difficult thing for us to do. We went about hiring them, bringing them and showcasing them. And, uh, you know, this all had come from, um, a mag uh, an article in Toronto Life magazine that mentioned, here are the kings building your city and you know kind of thought you know we kind of thought hey so where are the women here like they are also helping build your city so how come they're they're like forgotten from this whole conversation and article and um that project started to get a lot of publicity now i always say it's bittersweet because as good as the, that publicity was as good as it was to be you know um written about in New York Times and Oprah Magazine and all the publications in Canada, it also shed a light on the problem that we have in our industry and the fact that such thing does not exist or was not around and that females aren't being represented in the development industry. So we were very thankful for the attention we were getting, but also it sort of reconfirmed what we were thinking and what we knew and what we felt in this industry as women trying to um, find our way um, in the industry. So that project um, is now under construction. We topped it off and uh, in like a month and a half ago and we're aiming to do occupancies in the beginning of next year. Very proud of it and the building looks amazing. So, you know, it's going through the process as any other project would, but it it did it with um, a purpose and a reason, and it also showcased a lot of the women that were behind the scenes and were left behind the scenes, unfortunately, for a very long time. Amazing work. Uh, and innovation seems to be a theme that follows you around or, or kind of breaking through that glass ceiling. Uh, so thank you for, for all that you do. Well, let's talk about more glass ceilings. Let's talk about affordable housing. You have a passion for that. Where does that come from? I can't literally say where it is coming from. I just know that this is a problem and I, and I understand that it needs to be tackled. And I think the people and the groups that can tackle it are the development industry. The people who are profiting from the housing industry should be the people giving back to the crisis of housing unaffordability. So in my mind, I needed to become... Um, um, someone who had a part in doing this. And I also was very unhappy with what I was seeing in, in, you know, in our industry. I kind of, everybody was slowly starting to talk about the fact that, oh yeah, everything is becoming unaffordable and there's unaffordability. Not to the level that everybody's talking about it today, but everybody was starting to talk about it. And then everybody was sort of celebrating themselves doing 10 units in one, you know, a thousand unit condo doing 10 units as affordable and then the other person like celebrating 20 units and you know 5,000 units of, 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 of housing and it kind of made me wonder how many of those do we need to really tackle the problem of affordable housing and those numbers just didn't add up so I figured the only solution in my mind would be to um, do it at scale and Having had a father who was a philanthropist, I always wanted to make sure that anything I do in life, I am also giving back. And this was my giving back, especially since I had lost my father during the time when I was coming up with this model to COVID, of all things, um, at a very young age. So, you know, kind of inspired me and it uh, became um, a motivation for me to sort of 
push through and to go on and to do more projects. And, and as difficult as it has been to work on these affordable housing projects, I am more eager than before to push them ahead and to actually make them happen because I can see that this problem, not only it's not going away, but it's growing and growing and it needs a solution. How are you tackling it? Like, what is your solution? You're talking about how, you know, some people would congratulate themselves on 10 and thousands of units, having 10 affordable. How are you tackling it? Because, you know, you want to, of course, uh, be phys- financially viable, but at the same time, be a, uh, you know, uh, part of the solution. What, yeah. what are some of the things you're doing to uh, change things a little bit? So I- I'm going to like answer your, your question in two parts. First of all, I still think that those 10s and 20s should happen. Don't get me wrong. And um, I appreciate that they were celebrating it um, because, yes, that was still something that many of the developers are not doing, even those units, those number of small number of units. But I don't think it's enough. And I thought that there should be more that we would do. We do, and um, unless we do affordable housing at scale, I don't think we're dealing with the problem, and we're not coming up with a solution. So my solution to it was to figure out a way where you can do affordable housing at scale. And my projects right now um, are at scale, meaning that instead of dedicating a small percentage to affordable housing, I have actually reversed that. So I have 70% affordable housing, 30% market, which normally it's the reverse with less percentage given, a lot less percentage given to the affordable housing component. So our projects are 70% affordable housing, 30% market, and even that 30% that's market is still a component of the non-for-profit arm of the corporation. And that non-for-profit gives the profits from that 30% back to the 70% so that they can actually have the means to be able to do the project and cost subsidizes that profit back into the affordable housing part of the project. And that's how we came up with our way or our model of, of affordable housing. Very cool. I love that 70-30, that reverse model. Can you make it, like, is it financially, when you do the performa, is it, does it, does it work? Does it balance it out? Or do you have to add in extra dollars or look for dollars elsewhere? So if I were to do the affordable housing as a one concept and one model for the 70%, my financial model would not work. What we did, which is different, and which is the innovation on our side is we said, not only not only the model of financial model doesn't work, but also the non for profits that we want to work with do not have the capacity, or most of them, the ability to be able to, to do as many units as we want them to do in a project. Let's say, for example, one, our first project was 2,400 units. If I went to any of my non-for-profit partners and said, guys, take on the 70% of this 2,400 unit, it would not have worked because they wouldn't have the means. But what we did, in, in the, which is different, which comes from my background of how I grew in this industry is partnership. We went to seven uh, or eight of these non-for-profits and we said, hey, let's all come together. Each one of you bring in your own model. Each one of you bring in your own expertise, your solutions, your models, and let's put it all together to create that 70%. And that's why our financials work. Our performa actually pencils out based on the fact that we have so many different models that they complement each other at the end of the day and they make the performa work. But if I had, again, and I have that proven in, in, in even in our performa where you see one building not doing so well, one building is doing better, one building is doing great, and it kind of makes it work but you can see that if you were to do one of those models this would not have worked and that's what we did so we went to the non-for-profit partners and we said not only we want to offer as many types of housing when i say types i mean as many types of ownership and 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 rent and and options and support but also we want to offer um um we want to create a variety as far as the financials are concerned so that we can make this work and We were skeptical in the beginning and everybody was a skeptical. Everybody was sort of questioning me. Are you sure? Are you sure? We did the numbers and the numbers were like, you know, took a very long time for like for us to get a clean performa um, 
but we did. And eventually it worked. We did count on some incentives, like Bill 23 did give us a pretty good um, uh, bulk of the incentives that we would qualify for as a non-for-profit, which was the waivers of the DCs. And that does help. And yes, we are counting on potential CMAC financing and the RCFI program that we would qualify for. But those are those are not um, uh, things that you know we're we're hoping for. Those are sort of given, especially like the the Bill Twenty Three favor of the DCs is something that we incorporated into our performance. So creative, so innovative. And now, are the building you're talking about is this the inclusive? It's called. It's called the inclusive. Yes. Yeah, so tell me about that. How many units? Is 2,400, did you say? Well, only one of our sites has 2,400. We currently have about around 10,000 units of housing um, in different locations. So we have Toronto. We are going, working on the second location in Toronto. We have uh, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, where we have twenty over 2,500 units there. We have a Mississauga that we are working on currently to see where that would lead. And then we have uh, um, the second Toronto site. So all together around 10,000, give or take. Wow. Well, this is incredible. And you talked to some of those partners. I've seen uh, Habitat for Humanity, Wood Green, uh, and, and many, many others. Um, what, what's, what's in the future? What are you working on next? What, what are you thinking about in the next Getting these done. <laughs> <laughs> Getting these, of course. Yeah, you've got lots, of, lots uh, in the works. You know, as you kind of think of the future of Spotlight, um, anything on, the, on that wish list that you, you want to do? Well, I, I think I have, I have sort of checkmarked all of the things I wanted to. I wanted to do through Spotlight on my wish list. So, you know, we have 10,000 units. What I wish for and what I hope for is to have the three levels of government work with us so we can get these done faster, we can get them done better, and we can create more affordability and more possibility and opportunity for the people that are going to live in these communities. I am hoping for um, a little bit of, of um, uh, you know, progressive thinking from all different levels of government, different municipalities that we work in. You know, we have we have a project in Kitchener Waterloo and I use it as an example all the time that has been doing wonderfully and it's been pushing we've been pushing it, but the city is faster than us at times. And you know, the region is you know, supporting us. And we know that project is going to happen. And we know that project is going to be the first one that is starting up. But there are other other municipalities where, you know, we're being we're, we're dragging our feet and things aren't happening and things are slow and you know there is uh, i don't even know if like I, I everybody says every time i do a podcast i get myself into another trouble but you know there are different levels of government that we go to you know uh, including our federal government that we go to for meetings to talk about what we're doing, to talk about the number of units we can bring and how we can expand on this model and how we can build it everywhere, not only in Ontario, but all across Canada by using this model and this platform of partnership between private, non-for-profits and government. And we can't even get, you know, an hour of their time because I think it's not important enough. So, you know, we are struggling with those things. So if I were to say what my wish list is, my wish list is, to be able to get them to to work with us uh, um, more in a more streamlined process and to help not just us, all of the non for profits and the private sector that's working really hard to actually come up with solutions that will help tackle the unaffordability crisis because it's not only housing it's it's housing and everything else that's unaffordable these days Absolutely. and they all need to be tackled. What are some of the biggest challenges you're facing when you say, what are some of the barriers? Is it just uh, the speed of development? Is it the speed of approvals, that kind of thing? What are some of your biggest challenges as you work through these uh, units? Unfortunately, yes. The speed of development is definitely one. Speed of approval is another, uh, which is the same thing. Um, you know, Also, getting the financial industry to come in with an open mind and to understand that the, the requirements that they set in place for a for-profit entity cannot apply to the not-for-profit entity. And, you know, to also have our government put in more force behind 
the idea that if you are doing an affordable housing like we are doing, and when you have so many different models of housing that are incorporated into one project, one if, if, if the housing model is not one, then the financing model cannot be one either because it doesn't, it just doesn't fit. So you need to, when I say streamline is that if I go to an, an entity, a government entity that's supposed to be funding me, they can actually understand that my model is as complicated as all the members that are sitting around the table and carrying this project forward and that they need to have, um, they need a different look at their model and their financing and the things that they can get. Instead of do, doing nine applications, we need to do one application. Instead of going for nine different methods of funding, we need to go for one. And if our government is capable of doing that, then shouldn't that be something that we would access? And also to have the financial industry, as much as you know, everybody has their impact program or impact uh, side of you know uh, their institution, financial institution. I'm not sure if they are assessing the impact the proper way and they focus enough on the actual social side of the impact uh, versus many other things. And I think that needs to also be revisited. If we want to tackle this problem, we need to have a partnership on all sides, the financial level, the government, the private sector, non-for-profit, all of them working together and all of them trying to address the problem. Um, and I think, you know, my my wish list would be to get a few of these financial indus, indus, uh, institutions on board with our model, our idea, and our way of looking at impact, and our way of looking at tackling on affordability, as well as the government. That would be my, my dream. Very, very reasonable. And I think, uh, like, we, we see the government federally at least, turning some corners, right? They, they've made some announcements in the last little while. Right, does it leave you hopeful? Uh, and now, this will probably air after the upcoming budget, but this this upcoming federal budget is supposed to be all about housing. Um, are you hopeful? And have some of the changes been uh, helpful so far? I haven't seen anything that has been that helpful to me yet, and I am optimistic about what's coming. Um, we like to be heard. And we weren't hurt, unfortunately. So um, there has been money and announcements, but I always say there is announcements and then there's reality. So I am waiting for the reality to kick in because the announcements can happen and the reality takes a lot longer to actually kick in. So I'm waiting for that. So hopeful, definitely hopeful, because that's the only thing we can be. I'm an always optimist. If, or, if I wasn't an always optimist, I wouldn't be tackling you know, as many units as, as we have. And uh, on a, I wouldn't go on this, you know, I call it a crazy venture that I've gone on uh, after. But at the same time, I, um, you know, there's only a certain level of hope we can have at this point. So let's just wait and see. Hopefully the, hopefully the, the budget that's coming out, as you said, would be, um, would be making us all sort of uh, walk on cloud nine. I can't wait for that. Amazing, and I think what you're saying is lots of you know less talk, more action. Let's see it. Let's see it happen. If people want to find out more about the work you're doing, ask Spotlight if they want to partner, if they want to chat with you more, if they have an opportunity, maybe they can work with you on. Where do they go? How can they reach you? So they can definitely reach out to me personally on LinkedIn. I'm always available, but they can also reach out to the inclusive website and all the other partners that are mentioned that are part of the inclusive not for profit affordable housing, as well as spotlight developments offices where they can reach out to the team that's working here. And each one of them would be more than glad to speak to them. We are not only looking for the housing partners because we have all the other services that are we're offering within our projects. So we're always looking for um, partners on the non-for-profit and for-profit side to bring in services and be providers of these units. And, you know, we are also, like, I will use this opportunity to call out to the Indigenous community, which we are, you know, looking for partners in the in the development of, you know, the housing um, percentage that we've dedicated to the Indigenous community. Um, you know, we are, we are also working on many different aspects of of the project that are community benefits that, you know, we would hope to find more partners that can bring uh, more to the table and allow us to offer more to the families that are going to live within our communities. 
Amazing. Well, Sherry, thank you so much. 10,000 units. Incredible, incredible work. Uh, incredible partners. Incredible innovation. Uh, this you. is what we need to move forward in the housing crisis. And we're grateful to have a developer like you. Of course, it's, if it's going to be done, it's going to be female-led. Good for you. Uh, we so appreciate it. Uh, and, and look forward to having you back many times on the podcast to talk about all these wonderful things you're doing. Thank Take you. Care. I appreciate having me on.